They say opposites attract. That's why the Sleep Number Smart Bed is the best bed for couples. You like a bed that feels firm, but they want soft? Sleep Number does that. You want to sleep cooler while they like to feel warm? Sleep Number does that too. J.D. Power ranks Sleep Number number one in customer satisfaction with mattresses purchased in-store. And now save 40% on the Sleep Number Special Edition Smart Bed plus special financing. For J.D. Power 2023 award information, visit jdpower.com slash awards. Only at a Sleep Number store or sleepnumber.com. See store for details. I mean, the military, they did... Uh, acknowledge common partners, but they did that as a grace. The law mentioned a man and a wife. So by the law, I'm not equal. By the law, they shouldn't consider me. Um, a widower. A widower. And it was very clear to me that this is the next wall I need to take down. We need to change that. Hey listeners, it's Mishi. So this is our final episode of 2023, a challenging and tragic year, which has seen so much anger and violence and pain. For us here at Israel Story, it's been an incredibly intense year, as we've had to adapt and reinvent ourselves in order to produce stories that give a sense of what's going on all around us. We're now in the final, final stretch of our end-of-year listener drive, and we're hoping not only to reach our fundraising goal, but actually to surpass it. So if you haven't yet contributed, and you do feel that Israel's story has been there for you, and adds something important to your life, I really hope you take a moment, even right now, to go to our website, israelstory.org, and donate. Okay. So, the war has, sadly, brought many new people into the limelight. We've heard stories of casualties, and hostages, and survivors, and family members. And many of those stories have entered our hearts and never left. In some cases, we feel like we've gotten to know the heroes personally. One of the first big stories of the war, in that very first and crazy week after October 7th, was that of 30-year-old Sagi Golan from Herzliya, a decorated officer in an anti-terrorism unit who was killed in action in Beiri in the early hours of October 8th. His story made headlines because Sagi was supposed to have married his partner, Omer Ochana, two weeks later, and his death brought to the fore, once again, the matter of the army and LGBTQ rights. See, ever since the mid-90s, The IDF has recognized same-sex partners of fallen soldiers as eligible to receive all the rights, financial and emotional support, as heterosexual partners. But that was just a practice, and the matter was never enshrined in law. So in the weeks after Sagi's death, Omer led a successful campaign to legally secure the rights of same-sex and common-law partners of fallen soldiers. Our producers Mitch Ginsberg and Adina Karpuch went to talk to him. Um, my name is Omer, Omer Hanna, uh, Sagi's partner. And could you tell us a bit about a bit about yourself, like where you grew up? And so I grew up in a traditional family. I have five siblings. I'm the last one. I'm the sixth. And it was very clear to me since ever that I'm gay. At the age of 16, I came out from closet to my friends, and then to my family. So with my friends, it was like perfectly normal and fine. They accepted it right away. My family at the beginning thought it's something that it will pass away with time. I mean, my father have a very big family and they're very religious. So it was harder for him than for my mother. But it was a surprise for both of them. I mean, I don't think they imagined it is possible to have a a gay uh, child. And today my mother goes as a proud mother of a proud gay man. She's proud of it. She doesn't hide it. She's the first one who 
will support their Pride Month and the Pride and, you know, also my father as a Moroccan that, you know, made Aliyah from Morocco in, in ships. So eventually we all came to the same point. We we're all good with it. Can you tell us about meeting Sagi? Yeah. Uh, it was June 2018. Back then I was like almost 23. And there was a conference of young leadership uh, organization in Israel. I was sitting on the grass with uh, two of my friends. And Sagi came and he introduced himself. He said, hey, just, you know, starting talking, small talks. I mean, I was very excited because I felt he's like hidden on me. But it ended up with like a good conversation, but without us like exchanging numbers or uh, yeah. <laughs> And I was like too proud to ask his number. The conference got to an end and I was like walking out of the hotel. And then Sergey so like ran to me and said, hey, we haven't exchanged any contact details. So, and I was, yeah, let's, uh, let's do it. <laughs> It was Saturday, um, and on Sunday we had a, our first date. The very next day. Yeah. It was, I mean, Sagi was so, he was so handsome. He was so smart. He was the whole package. I didn't want to miss it. It was on the, on the Shuk Machniuda, the Shuk Machniuda market. We just sat there on a bar. The bar uh, closed on us. So we started walking on the street of Jerusalem for hours. And then uh, it was becoming late. So Sagi uh, walked with me to, to my car. And I was like, everything felt so perfect. Next to my car, an embarrassing moment. Me thinking about, is our first kiss going to be in a... In a parking lot. <laughs> and it was. We kissed. And even though it was like the Machna Yuda parking lot, I felt so secured. And the Machna Yuda market in Jerusalem is not like the most uh, gay-friendly place in the world. But I felt so comfortable. Driving back home, I was so excited I had to speak with someone. So I called my friend and uh, I was telling her it's too good to be true. There is a catcher. So... You started going out. When did you decide to bring him home? Not long after I met Sagi, it was very important for me to to be with Sagi at a Shabbat dinner. Shabbat dinner at my house is like the most special time of the week when you meet all of your family. It's a long, long table. Back then, my family was everything to me, you know, as a young adult. And then Sagi started to become the most important thing in my life. So I wanted those both things, my family and Sagi, to be connected. And, you know, I was afraid. It was the first man ever coming to my family as my partner. You know, I'm the prince of the house. You know? Everybody is, like, looking to take care of me and bringing somebody new to the family, it's bringing somebody new to 25 other person's lives. So, Was it kind of like this unspoken, um, you know, everyone be nice, but just like... Not at all. So the Johanna family doesn't, uh, you know, it works differently. You don't keep anything in your uh, stomach. Everybody says what they're thinking. It's, uh, it's a Moroccan house. It's filled with love and concern to each other. But it's also a loud house, and you need to be, you need to stand on your own. And even with all of their opinions about being gay and difficulties it summons to your life, everybody falls in love with Sagi immediately. And it couldn't be more perfect than it was. And then we just moved in together. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Like... Who's the messy one? Who leaves the hair in the shower? Sagi and I were very different from one another. He was the organized person. He was all about planning financially our life, um, you know, putting the things in order. And I was like 
the one that imagined everything and you know drawing my <laughs> my clothes all over the place he was about volunteering all day long and i was about let's go out together <laughs> he was a healthy one you know eating chia seeds and stuff like that things like <laughs> i personally cannot eat <laughs> Not a main staple in the Ohana family. In the Ohana family, you know, you do barbecue. So, we were different from one another, but we also admired each one way of life. Can you tell us a bit about how that morning went? Take your time, but... Yeah. You know what, I'll start on the 6th of October. That was a nice day. So on the 6th of October, his uh, sergeant uh, was getting married. And, uh, you know, we planned our wedding in the same time. Every wedding we we went to was like, we were looking on, the, on those small things. That, the details. Yeah, the details. What you can take uh, to your wedding and and uh, all of his uh, team members from his uh, service was in the wedding and they're like, they're goofy. <laughs> they're like dancing, uh, dancing like crazy and and we had a great time. And then we went back from the, from the wedding and uh, Sagi was drunk. <laughs> I was not... <laughs> Um driving uh, back to Italia, we we played uh, Powerful of uh, of Red Band, and we were screaming on the car. Such a good time. On that Saturday, I uh, woke up on the 7th of October to a siren. We went back to bed, opened the news. It's like he's hanging me. From behind, holding his phone, scrolling the news, the headlines were families are trapped. Terrorists. You know, as a paramedic, I saw some stuff. I treated people in hard conditions. But the images came from Telegram in that morning or something human cannot imagine so he jumped out of bed <sighs> and I'm not a morning person I saw him uh, putting uh, his IDF uniforms and I jumped out of bed as well <laughs> Usually Sagi made my coffee. <laughs> On that morning I made his. He was all over the place. He was texting. And I helped him pack. He was talking with his team. It all happened like really quickly. I told him, don't be a hero. He was like, we're getting married. In two weeks. We cast. He left. He had a motorcycle, so he, he wanted to drive the motorcycle to to the Adam base. When he bought the motorcycle, we had an agreement that he's not going to drive the motorcycle uh, in highways. And he was like, it's too urgent. I'm driving the motorcycle to the And I was like, no, you're not. So he drove the motorcycle to a different officer from the Latar unit. And they drove together to the Adam facility to to gear up. Where they were gonna yeah. And I was already uh, recruited as well. So you were also called up to the army that day? Yeah. So I was heading to the Lebanon uh, border and we talked on the phone and, you know, I had uh, so many things to sort out. And So you're heading north? And Sagi's heading to Berry. Yeah. 
So he arrived very around 5 p.m. that Saturday. So he got uh, a mission to uh, to extract all the families from the Kerem, which is the street uh, on Barry's uh, fence. Same fence they reached. And he was leading his team from one house to another, extracting uh, families. The house was burning. The street was filled with bodies, with tanks. It was like a, just a shit show. And I met the families that Sagi saved. And, you know, they, they are so grateful. And they remember him introducing himself behind the door, telling them, I'm Sagi from Herzliya. You're safe. <laughs> the last family they extracted, the father of the family told me he was thirsty because they was trapped for like so many hours. So Sagi gave him his water. I mean, it's a small detail, but uh, that was Sagi was. <laughs> Sagi extracted children from, from shelter. He, he covered their eyes so they won't have to see their Parents be slaughtered in the living room. And were you in touch this whole time? We had an equipment that... Uh, because both of us were very busy. To... To send their heart to each other on WhatsApp every round hour. Just to know that uh, the other one is okay. We didn't really had the time to to talk with each other so every round hour two hearts one for me one for me and then he stopped responding on Sunday morning he didn't answer and I was knowing for sure something happened I collapsed, I, I started to throw up, I fainted. I mean, my body couldn't suffer the thought. At that time, Sagi's brother was on his way to pick me up. My friends was on their way to pick me up. My mother was on the way to pick me up. And then there was a period of several days in which you just didn't know what exactly had happened? Between Tuesday to Wednesday, my sister woke, woke me up. I was uh, on my parents' house at Jerusalem. And she was, can you come down for a second? It was like 1 a.m. And I was, what do you want? And she was like, just come. So I went downstairs. And there were two officers standing there. They didn't say anything. As an Israeli, when two officers are standing at the front of your door, they don't have to say anything. It goes without saying. If, if you don't mind me asking what happened after that, I remember just, you know, getting into the car and driving into Wainana, where Eti, Sagi's mother, is living. And was it then, at, at that point, that you began to feel that on top of all of your grief, you were being treated differently as a same-sex couple? Yeah. And, you know, each family gets uh, a main officer that uh, escorts the family. And... Our main officer. He was uh, not sensitive. He just uh, ignored me. I remember realizing that the officer is homophobic. I mean, one of his jobs is to go over the funeral ceremony with us. You know, he took care to mention and to add his personal view to the to the situation. And 
I remember him telling me I, I will not be able to to tear my shirt on the funeral. In the Jewish funeral, you tear a bit the top of your shirt. You won't be able to do that because you're not a woman. Can I ask, yeah, at the but... funeral, um, did you did you tear your shirt? <laughs> I did. Was the officer there? The officer was there. You know, I was taught that if you see a wall that prevents you getting what you want, you should take it down. And he was a wall. So it was a two days war against him. Those two days were ended at the funeral. You know, Oz, Sagi's brother, they came to tear his shirt first, and he was, nobody tears his shirt until Omer does. Um, we used the same flowers ah, of the wedding centerpieces for Sagi's funeral and... Uh, Every leader came to sing uh, Zachit Ilayov, which was supposed to be our aisle song, and it was one of the biggest funeral at that time. And the funeral was an end of something and the beginning of a of a new thing. Mm-hmm. Was it then that your battle began um, to be officially recognized in law as a army widower? Yeah, you know, in the Shiva. There were so many people here, and I didn't want anyone to hug me. I didn't want to hear anything except we're going to fight on that. So you reached out to politicians and an enshrined in law that the army would treat same-sex widowers in the exact same way in terms of benefits and everything that they do for heterosexual couples. Is, Is that right? Yeah. And you were actually sitting there while the vote was happening in the Knesset. Yeah, the law had zero uh, Knesset members against it, and uh, and it passed. And how did you? How did that make you feel? Um, I expected to to feel a relief. I expected to feel something, but it just felt right. I mean, there is a long way to go still in order to achieve 100% equality for the gay community in Israel. (sighs) Being equal in death is not good enough. We need to be equal in life as well. and <laughs> שרוצות אותי קרוב אני יודע שזכיתי Leo 
אני יודע שזכיתי To get people excited about Boost Mobile's new nationwide 5G network, we're offering unlimited talk, text, and data for $25 a month. Forever. Even if you have a baby. Even if your baby has a baby. Even if you grow old and wrinkly and you start repeating yourself. Even if you start repeating yourself. Even if you're on your deathbed and you need to make one last call. Or text. Right, or text. The long-lost son you abandoned at birth. You'll still get unlimited talk, text, and data for just $25 a month with Boost Mobile. Forever. After 30 gigabytes, customers may experience slower speeds. Customers will pay $25 a month as long as they remain active on the Boost Unlimited plan. Forever. 